true believer can sing that with conviction. I am redeemed by the blood of Jesus. The price is paid. My debt is gone. Praise the Lord. So the chains that bind me no longer hold me because of Calvary. I am redeemed. What a great hymn, song or hymn that is. And I trust each and every one of us who are watching or here truly can sing that song from the core of our being. Because it is a reality. And if you have not trusted in Jesus Christ as your Savior, we urge you all to put your trust in Him before it is ever too late. Are you supposed to turn on this lamp? Okay, so, um, yeah, just in case. Baka madjo madili man diting na aking complexion. So, okay. Well, um, we just finished our s- uh, s- series on uh, the character study of Joseph. And we saw how God used Joseph to preserve the nation of Israel uh, and eventually for a purpose. Of course, God was going to bring the Messiah through that particular nation. So that uh, centuries later, we know that the Messiah that has been prophesied way back in Genesis 3.15, the seed of the woman, finally became flesh. God incarnate to the person of Jesus Christ so that he could become man and taste death for every man, his substitutionary sacrifice. And you know what an appropriate hymn our choir sung this morning because that's our topic this morning, the subject of redemption. Okay, We are now in the Lenten season, and I thought we would give a series of messages from the Gospel of John. But I, would th- I was thinking maybe we can start on the biblical narrative of the Gospel of John of the details that took place 2,000 years ago the circumstances that led to the crucifixion. But before we go to that, the Gospels normally tell us, because they are narratives, they tell us, tell us how things happen. Uh, the epistles, on the other hand, tell us why these happen. Okay? It is an explanation of why Christ came to the cross. So uh, before we go to our exposition, uh, let's turn our Bibles, therefore, to an epistle, 1 Corinthians chapter 6. We shall read only two verses, therefore we will read in unison. Shall we stand pleased to give God honor and do reverence? 1 Corinthians six nineteen to 20. Our title of our message is Bought with a Price. Or maybe let's start from verse 16 all the way to verse 20, reading it responsibly and together in the 20th verse. Verse 16. Uh, what know ye not that he which is joined to a harlot is one body for two saith he shall be one flesh flee fornication every sin that a man doeth is without the body but he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body Verse 20 together, for you are bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Our Father, again, we thank you for the opportunity to dive into your word. We ask that your Holy Spirit open our eyes that we may behold wondrous things out of thy law. Speak, have your work by using your word through thy spirit to meet needs, salvation or for sanctification. And we shall thank you for it when we pray in Jesus' name. You may be seated. I shall redeem by the blood of, I am redeemed rather by the blood of Jesus as the choir reminded us this morning. So we'll be talking about that subject specifically. Our message entitled Bought with a Price. We will be looking at uh, the great implications of the Christian redemption. Redeemed by the blood of Jesus. The subject of redemption is one of the key themes of Scripture. Uh, sometimes we use that term, for instance, to redeem a price. Okay, so minanalo ka sa tansan, no? tapos claim or redeem your price to this uh, redemption center, whatever they call it. Okay, the word redemption basically means deliverance by the payment of a ransom. Deliverance by the payment of a ransom. And there are theological and spiritual ramifications to this. The theological and spiritual redemption, according to the Bible, is accomplished by two ways. Number one is by sacrifice. 
And second is by power. Sinners, all of us are born in trespasses and sins, regardless of our religious background. Ano man ang kinagis na nating religion, as we would say it in Tagalog. We all are born in trespasses and sins. In the book of Psalms, we read earlier in the Sunday school, in Psalms 58, that we, uh, we are uh, born in trespasses and sins. Psalms 51, uh, rather, and that's in another passage, but Psalms 51, verse 5, it says, Behold, I was shaped in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. In Psalms 58, verse 3, the, the psalmist points out there that... Uh, We are rebellious from the womb. The wicked are estranged since when? And the Bible says all are wicked, all are sinners. The wicked are estranged from the womb and they go astray as soon as they be born speaking lies. That's how the inspired word of God describes the depravity of the human heart. Regardless of our religious affiliation or religious background. And that's why you and I, as sinners, by nature and by choice, need to be purchased out of the slave market of sin or to be redeemed. And this is accomplished by sacrifice and by power. By sacrifice meaning by the substitutionary and bloody sacrifice of Jesus Christ. There is no other way wherein sinners can be redeemed, not by rituals or relics or rosary beads or religion, or not even by our own righteousnesses. For Isaiah 64 verse 6 tells us that our righteousnesses are like what? Filthy rags. And pardon the language, but the Hebrew words for filthy rags is basically equivalent to the menstruous rags that women use during their period every month. That's how God compares our good works to menstruous ranks. How they stink in the nostrils of God, anthropomorphically speaking. Our good works cannot earn our points to heaven. That is why we need to be redeemed by sacrifice through the substitutionary and bloody sacrifice of Christ. And by power that is demonstrated by the resurrection and by the ascension of Jesus Christ. It's through the person and the work of Christ that sinners can only be redeemed. And exclusively through Christ's work and his person. In the Old Testament, the concept of redemption was done and must be done by a redeemer. But that it cannot just be any redeemer. The redeemer has to have certain qualifications in the Old Testament. Month number one, he must be near or nigh of kin. It's called the kinsman redeemer in Leviticus 25 verse 4. We see, we see this specially uh, illustrated and in the book of Ruth. Okay? So it has to be somebody who is near of kin who can redeem. Is For instance, in the Old Testament... If a person was in debt in the Jewish community, if a person was in deep debt, that sometimes in order to pay his debt, he would literally sell himself as a slave to a master. Okay? Now, the only one who can redeem him from that slavery has to be first qualification. He must be a kinsman redeemer. Somebody nigh of kin, it cannot just be anybody else. Now, the Bible tells us that Jesus Christ himself became our kinsman redeemer. He is the God-man. He became man just like every one of us, except he was without sin. So in other words, uh, Christ became our kinsman redeemer, someone who needed to bridge the gap between the unapproachably holy God and sinful man. He had to be a qualified bridge, or a qualified redeemer. And uh, there is nobody else who can fit that qualification but Jesus Christ. The gap between humanity and deity, Job chapter 9 verses 32 to 33 indicates that also. God is so unapproachably holy. You see, in our day, people have brought God down to their level. So that sometimes they call God as parting jest. Have you heard people talk to God that way? See, how, how, how um, presumptuous 
can man be in talking to a high and lofty deity that way? But God is high and unapproachably holy, perfectly sinless. And therefore, how can a sin, an unapproachably holy God maintain communion with a sinful man like us? There was no way that we could be in fellowship. Therefore, somebody has to bridge that gap between humanity and deity. And Jesus Christ, the Bible says, became man. He was born of a woman, Galatians 4.4. 4. Hebrews 2.9, he became man so that he could taste death for every man. He identified with our fallen humanity except sin. That's the first qualification of a redeemer. Second, he must be not only near of kin, he must be able to redeem. He must have the capacity to redeem. I'm a slave. How can I be redeemed even if he were a kinsman or a relative? So he must have the capacity to purchase me out of the slave market. So he must be able to, to redeem. Jeremiah 50 verse 34. Imagine yourself drowning in a, in a pool or in the beach. And here you are trying to gasp for air. So you cannot save yourself from your predicament. So somebody, a lifeguard, hopefully is ready to save you out from your drowning situation. Well, first, he must be what? He must be able to save. I mean, if I were to be the one to save you, and I don't know how to swim, I say, get back, I'm the pastor. And I jump down into that uh, beach and then drown myself if I don't know how to swim. I must be able to redeem. And Jesus Christ was certainly able to do that. Christ has the infinite capabilities and power to redeem sinful man. Nothing is beyond the circumference of the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. But not only should he be a kinsman redeemer, second, he must be able to redeem, he must be willing to redeem. We see that in Ruth, verses 4 and 4 through 6, or John 10, 18. Let me just turn your Bibles Please, to the Gospel of John, chapter 10. Was Jesus Christ willing to redeem? Well, John, chapter 10, verse 18, we read, uh, No man taketh, uh, I'll read from verse 17, Therefore doth my Father love me. Why? Because I lay down my life, that I might take it again. Verse 18, No man take it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down. I have power to take it again. This commandment have I received of my father. He was willing to redeem. Let's get back to our illustration. Here you are drowning. Now, here's one capable uh, lifeguard. Physically able. Knows how to swim. He can redeem you from your predicament of drowning. But if he's not willing, you'll still drown, aren't you? Thankfully, the Lord Jesus Christ is not only near of kin, He is able to redeem. Thirdly, He, is, he has the, not only the power to redeem, He is willing to redeem. He laid down His life for us. And lastly, He must precisely pay the bill. Pay it in full. Pay in full the just demands of breaking the law. So He is able, He is willing. And therefore, he must actually, if I'm in the slave market of sin, he must actually get out, get his checkbook or his get in his pocket the purchase price to redeem me. That's exactly what the Lord Jesus Christ did. Galatians chapter, we find that in Leviticus chapter 25, 27, but I'll turn you to a New Testament passage, Galatians chapter 3. Notice in verse 10, For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. I want you to follow me carefully, slowly in this verse. As many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, notice, Cursed is every one that continueth not in all things which are written in the book, book of the law to do them. Did you get the point of that passage? Cursed is every one who does not continue in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. In Tagalog, isinumpa ang sino man na hindi nagpapatuloy sa inuutos ng kautosan. 
Anybody here who has fulfilled the law uh, flawlessly, 100%? Of course, no one has. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And therefore, since we have all broken God's holy law, therefore every one of us is cursed. No exemption. Those of you are watching, listening, all of us have been cursed by breaking the law of God. Regardless of a religion, regardless of how uh, morally upright society sees us, we are all under God's curse. That's the sad condition we are all in. But notice in verse 13, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law. How? By being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. What a blessing. Christ became the curse. The sinless Son of God <clears throat> became the curse for us by dying at the cross of Calvary. So he actually paid the price in full. The just demands of uh, the holy law of God. And here in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Let's get back to our text once again. The apostle Paul is reminding the Corinthian believers. Of what God has done for them through Jesus Christ. Remember the background of the Corinthians. These were believers just like many of us here who are listening. If you've trusted in Christ as Savior, you are a child of God by faith in Christ. Okay. And he, Paul calls the Corinthian believers as brethren. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 verse 1. He knows that they have, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 2, to whom was he writing the epistle to? Unto the church of God which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, and with all that in every place call upon the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. So he's addressing believers here. And while they were believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, sadly, they were not manifesting their Christianity outwardly. They have been born again into the family of God, but they were not growing in the faith in their sanctification as they should. Some Christians are like that also today. Sometimes we fall into that same predicament. We have been born to the family of God through faith in Jesus Christ and through the miracle of the new birth, and yet we are not growing as we should. Have you ever seen a baby? You know, see how cute our babies are? Halos ayon natin padapuin ang langaw at lamok. How cute and chubby they are. Right, Alicia? Right, Ethan? Or whoever, whatever will be the next baby of, uh, of the Santoses, you know. I mean, every baby who was born into this world, the mother will see him or her as the cute little baby. My little angel. But deep beneath that chest are the seeds of rebellion, which he inherited or she inherited from Adam. And here were the Corinthian believers. They've been born into the family of God. And just like every Christian should, they should be growing in the faith by starting with the milk of the Word of God to the bread of the Word of God to the meat of the Word of God as we all should. Unfortunately for these Corinthian saints, they were beginning their Christian walk, but they, did, they stagnated. Okay, so guide gano ka cute ang mga anak natin, Pero after three months, cute pa rin yan. Six months, pagka one year, ganun pa rin, 18 inches pa rin. Or two years, but 20 inches pa rin, you start scratching. Her. Ano nangyari sa anak ko? Nauna ano? You know? She's been dwarfed. And some Christians, sadly, are like that. Some Christians to this very day, after 10 to 15 years in their Christian life, what primary verse do you know? Uh, mm, uh, maybe John 3.16 and they're stuck with John 3.16. Mabuting memorize pa John 3.16. You know. I hope this is not the picture of any one of us, but I guess in most cases, this is the situation. We allow the uh, world to fit us into its mold. We allow the flesh to drag us 
and at the same time Satan to allure us. And when we continue to allow that and learn, never learn to say no to the allurements of the world, to the promptings of the flesh and the temptations of the devil, then we are not going to grow as we should. The such were the Corinthian believers. No wonder there was backbiting. There was animosity. There was envy. There was strife. There was immorality in the congregation. There was toleration of false doctrine. And as we do this every first Sunday of the, of the month, remember the carnality was so bad, the situation was so, so uh, bad that even their, their carnality even surfaced during the worship service. Sadly. They did not know how to partake of the Lord's table. So Paul wrote 1 Corinthians to, as a letter of rebuke to these carnal Christians. They were babes in Christ and they remained babes in Christ when they should be maturing in the faith. Okay? So Paul was writing to carnal Christians and he reminds them of the greatness of the Christian redemption that has delivered them from such a depraved and dysfunctional background. Notice is their background in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 verses 9 to 11. These believers in Corinth, what was their lifestyle prior to knowing Christ the Savior? Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate. Okay. The word effeminate is a, another word for homosexual, but this is the weaker partner in a homosexual relationship. The next word is nor abusers of themselves with mankind. That's an old English translation, which is another word for homosexual. Okay, this is the stronger partner in a homosexual relationship. In a, in a homosexual relationship, there is the weaker and there's the stronger partner who leads the relationship. So these are those who abuse themselves with mankind. That's another word for homosexuality. Next word, nor thieves, nor, covet, nor covetous, I'm in verse 10, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. Walang makakapasok sa langit na mga to. You say, therefore, who will enter the kingdom of God? Well, listen. Notice in verse 11. And such were some of you. Wow. Praise the Lord. These adulterers, effeminate, abusers, or, with men, or homosexuals, thieves, covetous, drunkards, revilers, extortioners, all of them, although they do not deserve to go to heaven, they will not inherit the kingdom of God. But some of them came from this kind of dysfunctionality. Such were some of you. And then, that's the past tense. Were some of you. But you are washed. You are sanctified. You are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. So regardless of how dysfunctional and depraved our backgrounds may be, the Lord Jesus Christ, upon the miracle of the new birth, once we get saved and become Christians through the miracle of the new birth in Jesus Christ, our identity is replaced from our dysfunctionality to now our Redeemer. We are now in Christ. And if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. What a blessing. We've been redeemed, bought out of the slave market of sin. So no matter how bleak our background may be, the redemptive power of Christ has delivered us from sin and has got given us a new status and a new identity. Well, like I said earlier, we find in the gospel narratives an, an inspired account of what happened during Christ's life, passion, his death, and his resurrection. But we find in the epistles an explanation. The epistles explain to us the why it had to happen. The reasons behind it. And 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20 is one such passage. And therefore this should be a challenge to us all. We ought to live out our lives as those who have been truly redeemed. A reality that has already taken place to those who have trusted in Christ as Savior. All right, let's get to verses 19 to 20. 
three great implications of the Christian redemption. What are the implications of Christ purchasing us out of the slave market of sin? Number one, Christians are therefore a purchased community. Second, Christians are a privileged community. And thirdly, Christians are a purposed community. We are a, number one, purchased community. You are bought with a price. You have been bought with a price. We are a privileged community. In other words, we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And then we are a purposed community. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Okay. So let's tackle this one at a time. First of all, first implication of the Christian redemption. If you trusted in Christ as Savior, recognizing that Christ has paid the, your debt before God. There, therefore, this is a reality. You are a purchased community. You have, it says you are bought with a price. And that word are bought is, is in the aorist tense. Therefore, it means you have been or were bought with a price. This implies four things. Number one, that because we are a purchased community, this implies we were what? It implies slavery. We were bought. Okay. The Greek word for bought is the Greek word in the verb form, agorazo. In its noun form is the word agora. Okay. Those of us who are who have been to San Juan, okay, the agora. Agora market. That's redundant. Okay. The market market. Bagay sa dito naman sa ano ganun din market market. You know. The San Juan Agora market. Greek language that was in English. See. But the word agora means a market. That's the Greek. You learn the we learned some Hebrew words kanina sa Sunday school. Now we're learning some Greek words here. The word agora is the noun form, and it basically is the place where slaves could be purchased. It was the slave market. Agorazo is the verb form. Okay. To purchase is what it means. In other words, Paul is saying to these car carnal Christians or baby Christians, and they needed to know and be more aware of their spiritual privileges in Christ. Perhaps having been delivered from their homosexual lifestyle, they're being a thief, they're being uh, adulterers, uh, and they were still somehow wrestling with their identity. And Paul reminds us, hey, listen, you, do you not realize what Christ has done for you? You are a purchased community to be bought by the redemptive blood of the Lord Jesus Christ means what? It means to be released. It means to be liberated or to be set free from that old sinful lifestyle. It means to be liberated from the hideous and inhumane institution of slavery. Slavery from sin and slavery from self and Satan. If you were a former extortioner, a robber, an adulterer, a homosexual, a thief, a reviler, you name it. All of these mention, all of these sinful sins, expressions of sins. Regardless of your background, the moment you trust in Christ as Savior, by virtue of what Christ has done, you've been set free. What a blessing. You are no longer a slave of your sinful nature. We were born in trespasses and sins. And in the book of Romans chapter 5 and chapter 6, the Bible tells us that sin, what? Reigned over us. The apostle Paul in the book of Romans use, personifies, uses personification. He personifies sin as if he were a person. Sin reigned over us. Yeah, my, my watch is trying to understand what I'm saying here. <laughs> He's also listening. <laughs> sin reigns. In other words, sin was like a person here, personified, 
as if he were a master. And sin was reigning over us prior to conversion. That's a picture of everyone who, the a description of every sinner and a description of every Christian prior to knowing Christ as Savior. Sin reigned over us. Can you realize how, how cruel our master was? See, when, we have, when we're slaves and we slave a master, usually even in biblical times, the master will provide our needs. He will provide us our what? Our meals. Maybe an allowance. Okay? So our basic needs so that we can serve him. That's uh, the role of the master. Today, maybe an employee-employer relationship is the closest parallel that we can think of. We have our master, our employer, and of course we do service so that we can get paid, receive wages. The Bible tells us, you see how cruel our former master was? Why? Because despite of our service to sin, what does he pay us for? Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death. Apakalupit namang amo yan? Despite my service to my old master, his payment is death. Despite my yielding to my sinful passions, to my being a thief, a robber, an extortioner, an adulterer, a homosexual, regardless of our background, an extortioner, then my penalty is death. That's how he pays me. And that's how he pays you if you have not trusted in Christ as your Savior. Sin is your master. He reigns over you. You see, you see how foolish some people argue? I don't want to be a Christian, but I'm in Bawali. That means I have to give up my sin. So you rather stay under the slavery of a cruel master? So this idea of being redeemed by the blood of Christ carries three ideas. So in other words, we have been released, set free, it means to be relieved from a binding obligation by some special payment which we ourselves cannot pay. And it carries three ideas. That means man is held in captivity. Proverbs 5.22. Let me read that to you. Proverbs chapter 5, verse 22. His own iniquities, notice, shall take the wicked himself. And he shall be held with the cords of his sins. That's how sin works. Well, the Bible says, Masarap ang kasalanan eh. Tama. The Bible says that. The, the pleasures of sin. And that's what sin does. It offers pleasure. But it says in the book of Hebrews, the pleasures of sin are but for a season. Di ba masarap ang kasalanan? Pero panandalian lang ang binibigay ng kasarap ni kasalanan. Because after we have tasted the pleasures of sin, we start incurring the consequences of sin, which is slavery, disharmony, chaos. Have you watched these these uh, commercials? Okay. Okay. Iminum lang kayo. Iba talagang may pinagsamahan. Right? So, inuman tayo. Kasi pagka with this bottle... Uh, we can have friendship and quote unquote fellowship. Some, even some unsaved people will use Christian gargon. Mag fellowship, mag fellowship tayo over a bottle of beer. Pag pinanood yung commercial, puro ang sasaya nila. No? Gusto pa nila, bumubula yung, yung beer dun sa, bo, dun sa mug. You know? Pero pinakita ba nila sa commercial na pagkatapos ng inuman nila, ano nangyayari? They won't show that to you. People start throwing up. Now, uh, thankfully, I, I'm just thinking theoretically because I've never been drunk for my entire life, thankfully. But I've seen people drunk and they throw up and then they go home. If they reach home, okay, if they can drive home, okay, and they reach home and then comes the wife, Hi, honey. Uh, you know. You know. They're not showing that in the commercials, don't they? 
disharmony and chaos that takes place as a consequence of sin. And it can result in death. The wages of sin is death. You see. So the Bible tells us that uh, because we were slaves, therefore it means we are held captive. Second, we are helpless. Therefore, we're incapable of effecting our own rescue. Jeremiah 17, 9, the heart is deceitful above all things and is desperately wicked. Or, as other translations put it, is incurably sick. Who can know it? Jeremiah 13, 23. Jeremiah poses a rhetorical question. Can the Ethiopian change his skin and the leopard his spots? What's the answer? Can the Ethiopian, remember the Ethiopian has a dark skin. Can the Ethiopian change his skin? The answer is no. Can the leopard change his spots? The answer is no. So is everyone that is accustomed to do evil. Jeremiah 13, 23. We are totally incapable of rescuing ourselves from sin. This means man is held, means man is helpless. And thirdly, this means man is helped by the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the deliverer. He is the savior. Thank God nobody can save us from our sin but Jesus Christ. Have you come to Jesus Christ? John 6, 37, all that come to me, I will in no wise cast out. That's what Jesus said. John 6, 37. All that come to me, I will in no wise cast out. I will not reject anyone who comes to me in faith. So I'm calling everyone who's watching or listening to this message. If you have not trusted in Jesus Christ as your Savior, the Lord says, come to me. I will not cast you out. He can redeem you. He can cleanse you. He can rescue you from the slave market of sin as He promised. Because He already purchased it with His blood. What a blessing. It implies not only slavery, it implies historicity. We are bought or the aorist tense. We were bought. It's past tense with punctiliar action. That's what aorist indicates in the Greek language. Aorist tense means but punctiliar action it's the kind of action that happens in a point in time it's described as a period we were bought with a price and it implies historicity in other words it happened in history by one particular specific event and what is that real historical event we're called the crucifixion turn with me to Matthew chapter 20 verse 28 Matthew chapter 20, verse 28. I listed other verses there. Um, Mark 10, 45 and 1 Timothy 2, 6. But I will just for time's sake. Matthew 20, verse 28. The Bible tells us that even as the Son of Man came, not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give His life a ransom for many. Matthew 20, 28. Christ gave his life as a ransom for many. See. So it implies historicity. The kind, uh, in other words, it, uh, the, 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 the redemption was, was accomplished by an actual real historical event. And that's what we call the crucifixion. The word ransom means a redemptive payment through the event of the crucifixion. Our faith is not, in other words, suspended in space. It is not a product of philosophical speculation. But it is secured through the solid fact when God himself in Christ at the cross paid our penalty. It was there at the cross our ransom was paid. Paid in full. Praise God. It implies not only slavery and historicity, it implies finality. We are bought with a price. Notice that phrase, with a price. In other words, we are bought 
and it's been paid for. It's been actually paid for. Nothing remains to be done. All that the divine justice requires in payment for our sins. The heat of God's holiness against our sin. The outraged justice and righteousness of God because of our offense has all been consumed at the cross of Calvary and not on the basis of our human merit or our own credit. All that God requires for sinners now is not for us to pay for it, not to work for it. All that God requires for sinners is to respond to it how? By claiming it by faith. Whosoever believes in Him shall not perish but have everlasting life. You strip yourself of all self-righteousness and trust in the perfect righteousness of Christ to the saving of your soul. Have you done that? You cannot say, okay, I'm trusting in Christ, but I'm also trusting in Mary, in Buddha, in Allah, etc. No, no, no. Therefore, you're not trusting in Christ. In fact, you're doubting Him that way. You're going to say, I'm trusting Christ, but I will still try to earn my way to heaven. Therefore, you're not trusting in the sufficiency of Calvary. All that God requires for us is to put our trust in Him. Okay. That implies finality. And lastly, it implies legality. Slavery, historicity, finality, and legality. The word uh, bought... With a price. That word bought is a technical term. Or that bought with a price is a technical phrase. Of a deity in a pagan temple. By paying the price of his freedom. Okay. Uh, uh, it's a technical phrase used in commercial transactions. When slaves were set free from their earthly masters. And became slaves of a deity in a pagan temple. By paying the price of of his freedom that's how they did it in biblical times they will purchase that slave from the slave market pay the price for his redemption so that he becomes a slave of a new deity or of a new master see so there are legal implications to that it implies number one liberation from his cruel masters and for us, it implies liberation from our cruel master of, from the principle and penalty and power of sin and Satan. But it not only implies liberation, it also implies lordship. We now have a new master. We are slaves to a new and a benevolent master. And that is the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, which began with his substitutionary bloody payment. Okay, his benevolence was displayed on Calvary. By paying our freedom. And he continues to show his care and benevolence. With his constant care and provision. What a blessing. What a wonderful master we have. Now we can serve our new master, the Lord Jesus Christ. And he will pay us wages of righteousness, not of death. He will give us, and he has promised or us already life, new life in Jesus Christ. See, So Christians are purchased community. Second, Christians are a privileged community. That is 1 Corinthians 16, 19 to 20 say, it says, What know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit or the Holy Ghost who is in you, which you have of God, okay? And you are not your own. In other words, Christians are a privileged community. We are the what? The temple of the Holy Spirit who is in us. This is the result of our purchase. Because we've been freed from the bondage of sin we've been liberated now we are servants of a new master and as a result we become the temple of the holy spirit okay the greek word for temple here is the greek word naos it refers to the inner sanctum in the old testament tabernacle it refers to the sacred shrine or the holy of holies 
yung pinakagitna nun tabernacle. There's the holy place and then yung gitna only the high priest can enter that. It's the holy of holies. That's the naos, the Greek word for that. It's where God dwelt. His Shekinah glory would shine and where only the high priest is allowed to enter. If you will recall in the Old Testament, there were those unauthorized priests who entered into the Holy of Holies and we know what happened? Zap! They, they died. So only the authorized and only that naos, the, the naos or the temple was the dwelling place of God in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, you know where, the, where God is dwelling now? He's indwelling in every believer. The believer is the inner sanctum. Interesting that the Greek word, and there's another Greek word for temple. It's the Greek word uh, hieron. It's also referring to a sacred place, but it can refer to the temple precincts at large, where the court of the Gentiles. It can also refer to the court of the Israelite women, or the court of men. Or the court of the priests where the actual temple ritual was carried out. And the Greek word used for that is hieron. But now when you use the word naos, it's talking about the holy of holies. Which means what? A number of implications to the fact that the body now of the believer is a temple of the Holy Spirit. It means, one, Christians are a sacred residency. We are the inner sanctum of God. We are the image bearers of His divine glory. It also means Christians possess a sacred regency. That means we have a king residing within. <clears throat> and thirdly, Christians are His subordinates. You are not your own. Listen. The holiest place on earth is not St. Peter's Square in Italy or Rome. The holiest place on earth is not Mecca in Saudi Arabia. The holiest place on earth is not uh, in White Plains for the Mormons. And more so, it is not in Tandansora where the Iglesia Ni Cristo Temple lies. What some people call here as the Disneyland because it looks like, never mind, I might get into trouble. Somebody watches this. <clears throat> you know where the holiest place is? The holiest place on earth is where the Holy Spirit dwells. And that's the believer. The holiest place in church, in building, nothing. Look at our building. Doesn't look like a very, very sacred and holy place because it's just a rented apartment. You say, it's just a rented apartment. Why should I say it's just a rented? Because it is a rented apartment. But even if we had a fabulous building with all the marble floors and chandeliers, the holiest place on earth is not going to be that building, it's going to be the dwelling place of the Holy Spirit. And that is the Christian himself. What a blessing. And you know what that means? It means, like we already said, we are a sacred uh, residency, we are a sacred regency, and we are His subordinates. We are not our own. And this brings dignity and value to every Christian. Dignity and value that attaches itself to every child of God. Regardless of your background, I am the dwelling place, the inner sanctum of the Holy Spirit. It brings dignity and value. Second, it brings responsibility also. That means we need to be virtuous. It implies that we need to live a separate life. It implies separation from ungodly things. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Notice in verses, verse 18, Paul in instructing the Corinthian saints. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 16 to 18. What agreement hath the temple of God with idols? Paul gives a series of rhetorical questions here. Obvious answer, no. I'll read from verse 14. Be ye not unequally yoked with unbelievers. That's the command. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? There is none. 
What communion hath light with darkness? There is none. What concord hath Christ with Belial? That word concord means harmony. How can there harmony between Christ and Satan? There is none. Have you ever ima- can you ever imagine Jesus Christ having a duet with Satan? There cannot be any harmony there. It's just like when some of us sing a duet. I mean, we could hardly make a harmony, right? <laughs> but much more so with God and Satan. Further still reading. Uh, what, good, uh, what agreement at the temple of God with idols? Verse 16. For you are the temple of the living God as God has said, I will dwell in them and I will walk in them and I will be their God and they shall be my people. And wherefore... Ramification, practical application, come out from among them and be separate, saith the Lord. Touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Christian, listen here, young people. If you know Jesus Christ as your Savior, you ought to, because you are the temple of the Holy Spirit, resolve in your heart that you are going to marry none other than another Christian. Listen here, young people, and even adults. Because you're the temple of the Holy Spirit, you you and I ought to resolve within ourselves to to keep our bodies chaste and pure and holy and to give in to its sexual appetites only to to your spouse, to your husband and to your wife, and not to nobody else. Because you're the temple of the Holy Spirit. See, so we ought to give value to what we have, we are in Christ. Okay. <clears throat> so that's what it brings. It also brings its own. In other words, it means we need to be virtuous, implies separation from ungodly things, and there should therefore be no idolatry in our lives. It brings its own reward. We saw it in verse 18. I will be a father unto you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. He said, I thought I was already a child of God the moment they trust Christ and Savior. Yes, you are. John 1.12 says so. But to be able to in maintain fellowship or communion with the Heavenly Father, to have unhindered fellowship with the Heavenly Father is the reward that, bring, that is being brought to those who recognize the value of being indwelt by the Spirit of God. The truth of the matter is we will not sense intimate fellowship with the Heavenly Father when we often defile the temple of the Holy Spirit. And I'm afraid many of us do not enjoy communion with the, whole, with, with the Father only because of that. We defile His temple. Let me get to the last point. Christians are not only a purchased community and a privileged community. Christians a, is a purposed community. Going back to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19 and 20. Uh, you are the temple of the Holy Spirit, which you have of God, and you are not your own, for you are bought with a price. Therefore, application, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. So Christians are a purposed community. Therefore, that's the purpose that we have. We are to glorify God in our body and in our spirits, which are God's. The word therefore is the Greek word day. It is a participle of emphasis or explicitness or urgency. In other words, Paul is saying, now then, right now, speedily, Because of the fact that Christ has purchased you with his own blood. And you are the inner sanctum of the Holy Spirit. Therefore right now. Glorify God in your body. And that word glorify is the Greek word doxa sate. Doxa is the Greek word for glory. That's why we have the doxology. From the Greek word doxa. It means to glorify. It's where we get the word doxology. It's in the aorist active imperative. It's a command. Glorify God right now in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. 
So that is the purpose of every Christian. To glorify God. This is the overriding principle of everything that we ought to be doing. To glorify God. And therefore this ought to be a reminder to us all. That first of all Christians have identity. If we used to be living a lifestyle of thievery or extortion or homosexuality, you have a new identity. You are now in Christ. So we know who we are as Christians and where we came from. Have you ever asked you that question? This is a basic question. Who am I? Today, especially for young people, and I guess even adults, there are people who are wrestling with their identity. They're not even sure if they're male or female. And some cultures and societies tell you, okay, you can choose your gender when you reach a certain age. But that's not what the scripture tells us. For Christians, we know who we are. We know our identity. We are in Christ. So regardless of your background, the moment you receive Christ as Savior, that is your new identity. You are in Christ. Second, we have destiny. Have you ever asked that question, where am I going? For the believer, we know where we're going. We're headed to the Father's house. And lastly, we have utility, meaning we have a purpose. We know why we are here. And our chief end and goal in life is what? It is to glorify God. This should be the great overriding principle that, that regulates everything that we do. To glorify God means to be so in tune with God, so sensitive to His promptings through the Holy Spirit and through His Word, so that His glory shines through us, so that His divine attributes is reflected through us. We become more and more like Jesus Christ. There is no other purpose worth living for. So what is your, what is your purpose as a Christian? You know it now. It should be. But if you're not living according to that purpose, then you negate the purpose where God redeemed you. Like I said, there's no other purpose worth living for. This means, therefore, we are to cleanse ourselves from the sins of the flesh and of the body. Verse 20, therefore glorify God, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Do you know that there are sins of the flesh? And they're the sins of the spirit. And Paul seems to make a distinction here in 1 Corinthians 6 verse 20. We are to cleanse ourselves from number one. The sins of the body. As a matter of fact this is the context of 1 Corinthians 6. That's why I thought we'd read verse 15 down the line. In verse 18 what does it say? Flee fornication. Fuge. Remember we talked about that passage in our study of Joseph. We are not to fight fornication. We are to flee. Run. Not run to. Run from. Flee. Fornication. Fornication is a sin of the flesh. So we are to cleanse ourselves from the sins of the body. There are sins of the flesh. And there are sins of the spirit. The sins of the flesh are the overt sins. The sins of the spirit are the covert sins. Nakatago. Remember the story of the parable of the prodigal son? The prodigal, there are, such, there are sins of the prodigal son. We can see his sins. Remember, he got his inheritance and squandered his money away in rebellion against his father. That's very obviously glaringly wrong. But there was one son left at home. You think he's an obedient son. And yet, he was what? He, he had, if the prodigal sins or sins, prodigal son's sins can be seen. On the other hand, uh, the uh, bro elder brother's sins are the sins of arrogance and pride. And usually these sins are more subtle and they are underneath. They're not easily visually seen. Such as, turn with me to Ephesians chapter 4 very quickly as I conclude. What are some of these sins of the Spirit? Ephesians 4, 30 and 30. 
30 to 32. Paul says, Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. Let all bitterness. Ano sa Tagalog yan? Lahat. Notice, it's word all. Andyan yung all. Lahat ng uri ng sama ng loob. Yan ang sins of the Spirit. All bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking, let all these be put away from you with all malice. But be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. Those are the sins of the Spirit. See, baka meron sa dibdib natin, no? nakangiti, there's a welcome here. Pagkatapos, pagtalikod, hmm? Dapat di ko kakamayan yun eh. We sing, Oh, how I love Jesus. Tapos pagtalikod, kung ano nang sinasabi natin doon sa katabi natin. O lalo na sa pastor, ang haba ni pastor mag-preach, pambira naman. You know? Alright, that's why I have to move on. Ayokong sumamaan loob ninyo sa akin. Ha? By the way, you just heard the message. Ha? Walang sasama ng loob sa akin. At sa, ako rin naman sa inyo. Okay. So we are to cleanse ourselves from the sins of the body and the sins of the flesh. And the sins of the spirit. So, and we are not to allow the appetites of the body or the attitudes of the spirit to de to do to degenerate ourselves to sin, because if we do, we negate we negate ourselves of our divine purpose. So, let me just apply it a little further. Because we are the temple of the Holy Spirit, am I going to use this body to simply satisfy? It's fleshly appetites. Am I going to paint this body with graffiti and tattoos knowing that it is the temple of the Holy Spirit? Can you imagine what will happen to you if you go and use a paintbrush and put paint and then go to the Iglesia de Cristo and start painting their wall? Or graffiti, you know. Ibagsak, etc., etc. Or... Chris was here or something like that, you know. I mean, we can just imagine they'll be angry. Hey, that's our temple. It's kept holy. When we know that the holiest place on earth is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Am I going to punch the temple with holes in different parts? Punch dito, punch dito, punch kung saan saan, you know. It's the temple of the Holy Spirit. Am I going to abuse it with vice or suffocate it with cigars and smoke? I remember I was talking to one. He was a guy taller. Well, most guys are taller than I am anyway. He was taller than I am. And uh, he was a new Christian. And he was wondering if it was proper for the Christian to smoke. I said, is there a passage in the Bible that says no smoking? There is none. I told him. But there's a passage the Bible says. The Bible says the temple body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And his response was, immediately, inisip niya. Every time he would, you know, uh, when he starts inhaling that smoke, that he imagined <coughs> the Holy Spirit is coughing within. You know? That's what he thought. Oops. Immediately, he dropped smoking. Am I going to intentionally burn my body after death? Bali kung namatay ka because of arson. Okay. But am I going to purposely and intentionally burn my body to death, to ashes, knowing that the body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? I'm going to leave these questions to you. And I almost answered it uh, you know, explicitly. But these are some practical ramifications of what it means to be bought with a price and to be indwelt by the Spirit of God. And what a blessing it is to, be, to see the greatness of our Christian redemption. So my challenge is, are you redeemed by the blood of Christ? If not, I urge you to trust in Christ before it is ever too late. Receive Him now as your Savior and Lord. And if you have, then are we now slaves? Deliberately, lilfully, slaves of our new master? 
Do we heed his every command? You know, a slave in biblical times has no will of his own. He has only one will, and that's the will of his master. And for the Christian, it's the will of God. Do we defile the temple of God? Do we exist to be, to do the bidding of our master? Is our life a radiant testimony to the glory of God? Or have we clouded the transparency of what God intended by our own sinfulness or selfishness? I pray God speak to each of our hearts. Let us pray. Our Father, we thank you for all the ramifications of what has been accomplished at Calvary. When in one, moment, one point in time, the eternal Son of God tabernacled in human flesh to purchase our debt and to save us, deliver us from the slave market of sin for those of us who finally have trusted in Christ. And therefore, as believers, help us, Lord, to simply yield everything to you, for rightfully so. We are not only yours by creation, we are yours by the new creation, by, re by redemption. And make our wills be lost in thine. That anyone here who is not trusted in Christ, I urge him to trust him. Work in his heart, I pray, so that he will finally come to know you as Savior and Lord. We pray in Jesus' name.